So open your Bibles, if you want, to, to Luke chapter 2, and we'll start our reading in verse 4, and we'll go from there. Verse 4, Luke chapter 2. And Joseph also went up from Galilee to the, to the town of Nazareth, to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field. Would you underline that phrase, out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night? And the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled filled with great fear. And underline that phrase, filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that they had been told concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and all they had seen, and it had, be told, it had been told to them. So our first point is that God is involved in our everyday lives. God is involved in our everyday lives. And often we fail to appreciate God's involvement in our everyday lives and in the mundane, the regular interactions in our lives, because we're looking for miracles We think we can recognize and identify God's involvement in our lives when he violates the laws of physics and performs miracles for us. We've probably seen some miracles right here at this church, but God is involved in the the mundane and the ordinary in our lives. When I was a boy, my my dad moved the family from Minnesota to California, and there was another family in the neighborhood that also had three boys in the family. We had three boys in my family, there were three boys in that family. I was probably about, I don't know, sixth grade at the time. And I met a friend who was the oldest boy in that family, and I'm the oldest boy in my family. And we became, we're lifelong friends. We're still friends today and still interact. And my middle brother became friends with their middle son, and my youngest brother became friends with the baby of their family. His name was Chris. My brother's name was Brad. And they maintained a friendship for decades. They're still friends. And about the time when they were... They graduated from college, so about that era in their life, Brad and Chris decided to go surfing. So Brad picked Chris up. They'd been friends for decades, and they threw their boards in the back of Brad's car, and they were driving to go surfing. And that song came on the radio. How many are old enough to remember an old Carol King song? You're so far away. Doesn't anybody stay in one place? Yeah. That song came on the radio. So that's when this happened. And Brad was yammering on talking and talking and talking, not paying any attention. And eventually, while the song was playing, he looked over at Chris, and Chris had tears on his cheeks. And Brad pulled the car over, and he said, oh my gosh, what's going on? And Chris said, that song reminds me of my mom. And he told Brad this story, that when Chris was a three-year-old boy, he remembers that song playing on the radio. And he was playing in the little kitchenette area of their apartment, and he looked out the window to the courtyard down below and saw his older brothers playing with the other kids from the apartment complex. And he was playing with a flex straw like you you might get out of a juice box that he'd just gotten from his mother because they went to visit mom in the hospital. And she wanted to give Chris something to remember her by. And all she had was was stupid straw, the only thing she had, and she gave it to her baby. And he's playing with that straw, And that song came on the radio, You're So Far Away. And he said, I remember looking over the the Detroit skyline, the cityscape, and I I looked over to where I imagined the hospital might be. And I thought about, Mom, you're so far away. 
And in his little three-year-old brain, he prayed a prayer. God, please heal my mommy. And please bring her back to this family. And he didn't know what cancer was, but he knew that it scared all the adults in the room. And I imagine mom was in the hospital praying a, a prayer of her own because dad was passed out on the couch. He was a drug addict, and he was not fit to take care of this family on his own. So she probably said, God, please don't take me from my babies. That family needs me. My husband can't keep a job. He can't care for those kids. And if I'm not there, I don't know what's going to become of them. And Chris heard this song years later and was still crying because of that moment. All he had to remember his mother by was this stupid straw. And God did not give them a miracle. God took his, his mom home. And Chris lost his, his mother. And that husband lost his wife. Because God said no. But God did not give up on that family. He was involved in their lives and continued to be involved in their lives. So the story continues with dad getting saved. And he gathered up the parts of his life, and he went to Bible college. And he became a pastor, and he started a church. And that church was a popular church in the town that we lived in when we all were friends together. And he raised his three sons, and they all went to Bible college, and they became church leaders. And because of that family, hundreds of, maybe thousands of families have been affected for Christ, and souls were saved, and lives were transformed. God remained active even in the mundane parts of their lives, even when they didn't get the miracle they asked for. So when Chris and his mom asked for miraculous healing, God's hand never left that family. Psalm 139 talks about that. It talks about God being with us always. God is with us. And it says, part of what you'll hear is that God, is, God is, goes before us. So God's not surprised by the things we say and do. He knows what's going to happen before we do them. And God is behind us, ordering the events in our life to bring about his perfect plan for eternity. Psalm 139 says this, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in, behind, and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, and I cannot attain it. So God is with us, even in the mundane and the miraculous. Even when God announced the most miraculous event in the history of eternity to some shepherds, God was there. Let's look at our notes. Down through the ages, shepherds have been primarily lower class and often poor and uneducated. In a family, shepherding was usually done by the youngest son or hired out by owners that could afford it. Although shepherding involved a unique skill set, let's just say the shepherds didn't accumulate much student debt. They were mostly uneducated and impoverished. Yet God chose to reveal the birth of Jesus Christ to them. And the Bible doesn't say when Jesus was born. There's a good chance that we celebrate it at the wrong time of year. Because Bethlehem was a rural town, five miles from Jerusalem. Would you put the the picture of the map up? So up at the top of our screen, see the little red dot up there that says Nazareth? That's where Joseph and Mary came from. And go all the way down, you can see Jerusalem toward the bottom. And below that is Bethlehem. That's where Jesus was born. Can we see the next picture of of modern day? This is modern day Bethlehem. Behind there, the buildings you see is is today, Bethlehem. And there's still grazing sheep in those fields today. Those are the fields that the shepherds were grazing sheep in. And it's still happening today. So this is a real place in real history. Bethlehem was a rural town five miles from Jerusalem with open fields for grazing sheep. Though the shepherds graze sheep all times of the year, because of winter storms, most shepherds would put the sheep in pens near the town after October. So what happens is when the weather changes, the shepherds don't go out to open fields. They bring the sheep closer to town and put them in pens where they won't freeze. So it's likely 
we've got our timing wrong about Christmas. As the sheep and shepherds in the Christmas story were in the open fields at night, Jesus' birth may have been uh, in the summer or early fall. So our first, first principle is this. God's interaction can come at any time of year or at any time in our lives. Often it's life events that return people to church. It's life events that get us looking, looking to God again. I think after 9-11, church attendance was at an all-time high in America. That event drove people back to church. And there's this dynamic that happens in the American church. It's unfortunate, but it's still real. It really happens. Parents bring their kids to church, and the kids grow up in the church. And by the time they turn 18 or so, they graduate from high school, maybe go off to college and move out from their parents' home and stop going to church. And sometime in the future, most of them return when some life event happens in, 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 to them, and they come back to church to get close to God again. Life events like marriage, or the birth of a child, or disease, or the death of a loved one. Something reminds us that there's more to life than me, and we get, go back to, God, to church to get close to God because we recognize the need of God in our lives. The shepherds were watching over their animals by taking three-hour shifts to protect them. Then an angel descended and terrified the shepherds with his presence. In Greek, the words are megas phobos. It means fear with massive fear. It's, it's mega fear. Next principle is this. Sometimes God uses divine reality to startle us awake from human complacency. So dad moved the family to California, and we began attending a church, and I was in about sixth grade, maybe seventh grade, and the pastor approached me not, soon, not long after um, we joined that church, and he said, you've got, a, you've got an unusual name. I'm named after my grandfather. And he said, do you happen to know Wilhelm Christian Honestad? I said, that's my grandfather. He said, it is. He was my college roommate at Luther Seminary in Minneapolis. And I said, wow. Well, so that pastor kind of took a liking to me and took me under his wing. And not too long after that, I didn't see him at church anymore. And I heard from one of the adults in the church what had happened to him. He went with the youth group from the church to a beach day and went body surfing with some of the high schoolers and broke his neck became a paraplegic. He could not feel or move anything below his neck. Not too long after that, I saw him back at church. And I wondered how. So I went and talked to him and said, what happened? And he said, I was body surfing and I, there was a shore break and there was shallow water and I broke my neck. And they took me to Hogue Hospital and I couldn't move and I couldn't feel. And I spent some time there, and they decided to move me into a nursing home so I could get used to living the rest of my life like this. And it was sunset in the nursing home, and the lights were getting dark, and my room was dark. And I noticed a bright light in my room, and I recognized the presence of God. And he was sore afraid. And after a period of time in the presence of God, the light dissipated, and the room became dark again. But he noticed suddenly that he could feel his legs, and he could move his legs. And he sat up in bed, and he walked out to the nurse's station to tell them what happened. <laughs> and now he came back to church, and he wanted to tell me personally that story because it was so important to him. And he held my shoulders and looked intently in my eyes to tell me I learned that God is real. He'd been a pastor for 40 years and never knew that he was serving a living God. He viewed God as mythological folklore, not something that was real. Those, those events didn't really happen, but we can learn good life lessons from them. Well, this event changed, this miraculous event changed his life, and he wanted me to know that God was real. And then he wrote a book. This is true. You can look it up. The title of the book is, What Do I Have to Do? Break My Neck? The angel told them that in King David's birthplace, the ultimate king had been born. Unexpectedly, God revealed the greatest news in history to illiterate, 
lower class men with no social clout. God delights in using the forgotten and marginalized to do the unforgettable and central. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 30 says this, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became, who became to us wisdom from God, righteous, and sanctification, and redemption. So here's the point I want to leave you with. God has gifted you to bring God glory. And often we feel, we feel insufficient, like working for God is, is left to those special people. I'm not smart enough, or I'm not young enough, or I'm not old enough, or I'm not educated enough, or I'm not something enough. And I want to encourage you to put that aside. Because while we are insufficient, God is sufficient. And God wants you in the game. You're a part of his story. You are a part of history. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The problem is we're hard of hearing. God tries to get our attention, and we don't hear him. And sometimes he has a way of turning up the volume. You've heard people say they hear God in a small, still voice. For some people, that's enough. And they hear the voice of God and sense the voice of God and obey it. Other people don't. And sometimes God turns up the volume and he allows a crisis of conscience to happen. That's when we suddenly become aware that what I'm doing is displeasing to God. Sometimes we have a crisis of conscience when we hear a sermon that we think is directed just at me. Or I watch a movie and something in the movie says, I'm doing that too. Maybe we hear a song or see an advertisement, but God somehow reveals to us in our conscience that our lives are displeasing to him, and we have a crisis of conscience. For most of us, that's probably enough to get our attention. And for some people, it's not, and God turns up the volume. And he'll, he may allow a crisis of circumstance, and that's when events in our lives crash together in a moment in which we realize our life will never be the same. And we have a decision to make in that moment. Will I follow God? Or will I continue to live a life that rejects God? Different, but still separated from God. Because God has a way of getting our attention, just like he did to my pastor when I was a small boy. Just like he did to these shepherds. I want to remind you that God's created you. And he's already prepared you to serve this church, and he's already prepared you to serve others, because you are part of his story. So let's listen to the word of God, and let's respond to it today. Sounds like you might get to keep your job. <laughs> in your notes, Pastor Bill had, number one, God is involved in our everyday lives. God isn't just out there somewhere. He's involved in everyday lives. And I have number two in your notes. God brings joy to our everyday lives. God brings joy to our everyday lives. For many of us, these seasons are not joyful. Um, we've lost loved ones. Some of us have lost loved ones to COVID, or maybe we got sick, or we have relational issues. I mean, how many of you guys just went through Thanksgiving? <laughs> Nothing brings out the dysfunction of family lines like the holidays. So for many of us, when we do Thanksgiving, when we do Christmas, and we have to think about what presents we're going to buy for who or who we're not going to buy presents for. Or if you're in a marriage that, you know, the mom-in-law wants Christmas and the other mom-in-law wants, you know, Christmas, and then you got to figure out whose family are we going to. And it, holidays oftentimes just turn into drama. And here's the thing, ready? I'm going to lay something out for you that may be totally new to you. Scripture never, ever once tells us you are going to be happy every day. It doesn't say when you come to Jesus, you're going to be happy every day. Ready? I'm going to break something down for you because our culture has, has lied to you. 
it's basically taught you the idea that you should be happy every day. If you're not happy every day, something's wrong. And so we get into these weird modes of like, I'm not happy today, how can I get happier? So we go back to our addictions, or we get high again, or we get a, jump into another relationship, and we go, this will distract me for a minute, I just want to be happy today. Let me, let me fix something in your mind, because it'll change the rest of your life. If you, your mind is poisoned by our culture telling you, just to be happy, fix yourself, do self-help stuff, or whatever. Scripture says this, you can't always be happy, but you can always have joy. We kind of go, what's the difference? Happiness is based on your circumstance. So in other words, you got a, you got a raise or you got some money for Christmas or you got a toy or whatever. And it's like, yay, yay. And it's that momentary high of happiness. But like for all of us, we get those highs of happiness and we get those just crashing lows of depression. And our, our lives just seem to be these weird roller coasters of, this is the best day ever. I hate my life. This is the best day ever. I hate my life. This is the best day ever. I can't, I don't want to go any, on any longer. Ready? Biblical joy outlasts and outlives circumstance. And it outlasts and outlives your happiness. Moments of happiness are awesome. Get a lot of money, awesome. Get into a new relationship or you get married, awesome. Have sex for the first time, praise God in heaven. There are moments of just pure joy and pure happiness. But listen, those moments don't last. So what do you do with the rest of your life? You have to have joy. Joy comes from knowing the God who loves you. The reason we feel empty is because we don't know the God that loves us. When we know the God that loves us, now we can have joy even when life is bad. Or when life is good, it doesn't matter. Because joy says, I know my God, and God loves me. And in every circumstance, I can have peace, knowing that God's got my back, and that even when things are going wrong and crashing around me, I know God's got me. That gives me joy, knowing I can get through hard times. I don't just have to feel happy every day. The shepherds here are going to have one of the most joyous moments of their, of their lives, but it, it'll be a joy that lasts the rest of their lives. So look in your notes. Once the angels told them the good news, the shepherds the good news of God's salvation, the shepherds leave their animals and quickly run off to Bethlehem to find Jesus. So I want you to look in your Bible in Luke 2. What Pastor Bill read in, in uh, Luke 2, verse 10. Look at it. Luke 2, 10. And the angel said to them, fear not. So the angel shows up. Imagine an angel of God showing up in your everyday life. You're just taking care of animals. They stink. They're pooping all over. They're vomiting. One's, you know, running away. One broke his leg. I mean, it's just drama. It's like your own family. (laughs) Just dealing with sheep is hard. You're uneducated. You didn't go to school. You probably can't read. So you got to make a living, so you're taking care of sheep. It's like the lowest on the social scale, like anybody can take care of sheep, but it's still hard. So think about these guys. They're just grinding it out in the hills with their sheep. It's a regular everyday job. It's a regular night. Could have been in the summer, could have been in the fall. They're just hanging out, taking care of the sheep. And all of a sudden, bam, an angel shows up and just rips through their reality. And all of a sudden, they're like scared for their lives. Megas Phobos, they're, they're massively scared. And the angel says to them, fear not. Don't be, don't be afraid. I'm not going to kill you. I'm actually going to do one of the most amazing things that have, has ever happened in your life. I'm going to give you this news. And look at verse 10. Fear not, for behold, what? I bring you what? I bring you good news. If you haven't circled that in your Bible, circle it. Right next to it in your Bible, write the word evangelism because it's the Greek word euangelion. From the Greek word euangelion, we get the word evangelism and evangelist. You know what those words mean? It means there's good news. An evangelist is a teller of good news. So this angel's an evangelist. Behold, I bring you euangelion, which is, I bring you good news. What's the good news? We won the lotto. What's the good news? I get to learn to read and write. What's the good news? Look at it. That, it, that shall be for great joy for all the people. Verse 11, for unto you is born the state in the city of David. Oh, what? A savior. Ready? You want to know how to have joy in your life? You have to know who your God is, and that God is your savior. You have to know your savior. 
The good news of the Bible isn't that you'll be happy every day. The good news of the Bible isn't that you won't get cancer. The good news of the Bible isn't that you won't die. The good news of the Bible isn't that everything will go your way. The good news of the Bible is that you have a God who loves you and will save you. That means that even in this world, God walks with you. Even when you're dead, you will have eternal life with Jesus. That's the good news. The good news is that your life is secure with the God who loves you both in this world and in the next. That's the good news. That's the euangelion. And the shepherds now are filled with joy that they have finally found the greatest news in history. Ready? And here's our principle. The greater the good news, the quicker it should be told. The greater the good news you've got in your life, the quicker it should be told. We are, we are social creatures, which is why COVID was so hard for the whole world. Because it separated us. You had to be at home with your wife. (laughs) And your husband. For long, long periods of time. And it put your marriage to the absolute test. And with your children that you were like, why did we have all of these kids? (laughs) Ready? We are built to be social creatures. We're built for community. We're built to be together. And you know what? When you have good news, you're built to go, I got this good news. You know what? Animals don't do that. Animals don't go tell the good news of somebody being born. Hey, we had a litter of puppies. Let me tell you about it. We're the ones who say, check out my puppies. Dogs are like, yeah, we had some dogs. There they are, small. They're over there, crying and pooping. Dogs don't care. Roaches don't care. Antelope don't care. Whales don't care. They just go about life. They don't tell stories. They don't say, you know what's awesome in my life? This thing, let me tell you. You know what the euangelion in my life, the good news in my life is? Here's this thing. We're built for that. We're built for story. We're built for great news. Tell me something great. Let me ask you a question. What is the greatest news in your life? What's the greatest news? Hey, I'm graduating from college this year. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm engaged. Uh, in between this service, I had multiple people come up to me at the Black Gazebo and go, hey, you know, we just got engaged. And it's young men I've watched grow up, some of the guys from Linfield. And they're all becoming young men because they're, they're my son's age. And they just, got, they just got engaged. I'm like, I was so happy for them. And they came up and told me. And you know, she showed me a ring or whatever. I'm like, Dang, girl, sweet. He must have worked extra. <laughs> Little OT. The point is this. When you have good news, you go tell somebody. What's your greatest news? You made a million dollars off of Bitcoin or some MFTs or whatever. And like, wow, you can't believe how much money I made this last week. So it's unbelievable. I made a million dollars. And you run around and tell everybody. And you know what you do? You go, dude, you got to get on Bitcoin. Dude, this thing is taking off like a rocket. Get on some NFTs. Like we're going to have some digital property you need to buy. Like, jump on board. It's like the beginning of Apple or Google or whatever. Like, get on board. When you have good news, you go, I got to tell you, this is one of the greatest things in my life. Come on. And when the Vikings win the Super Bowl, it's one of the best days of your life. <laughs> that day hasn't happened yet, but it will be the big greatest day of my life. <laughs> here's the point. Ready? Here, here's, here's bringing it home. The shepherds were so excited. You know what they were excited about? Their greatest news was was Jesus. When is the last time, if you're a follower of Jesus, that you've ever told somebody about Jesus? Here's the thing. Everything that's that's a great news for you, you tell. I know what your greatest values are by what comes out of your mouth. All I have to do is take an inventory of the words you use, and I will be able to know what your high values are. Because what comes out of your mouth is the high values of your heart. Could be sports, could be making money, could be being popular on TikTok or whatever. Hey, I got a million views on my TikTok video or whatever. It's like, whatever, whatever you love comes out of your mouth. Let me ask you this question. When is the last time you told anybody about Jesus? Because that's the greatest news in history. I don't care how much money you make. If you make a lot of money, awesome. Manage it well. Don't spend it all on yourself. We got a, we got a, we got a home to build. If you, if you have a lot of money, man, give to that. If you have a little bit of money, man, give to that. Manage your money well. Don't spend it all on yourself. Spend it all for the glory of God. Some of it, if it blesses you, awesome. But don't let your money just bless yourself. 
Your money wasn't just given to you to just live some cake life. Your money's given to you to bless the kingdom of God. If you're popular, awesome. Use your popularity for the glory of God. God blows you up on TikTok or Facebook or YouTube or whatever. Awesome. Sweet. Nothing wrong with pop, being popular. Nothing wrong with having a lot of money. But the point is, is that whatever God gives you, manage it well for the glory of God. It shouldn't be a mystery that you're a Christian. It shouldn't be a mystery that you have the greatest news ever in the history of the world. But we get excited about stuff that just fades away. We get excited about stuff at the mall. We get excited about, we blow ourselves out on credit cards to buy stuff for people that are just going to put it in a yard sale in June. And when that bill comes, that visa bill comes in January, we go, dude, why did I blow myself out? Live within your means. Live within your means. Use what God has given you. Don't get stuck in materialism. Having, having nice stuff is great, but you don't live for that. Live for Jesus. The greatest news is Jesus. Not that you got some new stuff. When's the last time you brought somebody to church? When's the last time you, in it, you interacted with somebody for the gospel? Because if Jesus has never come out of your mouth, how can you say you even love Jesus? Because your high values will come out of your mouth. And the shepherds here, man, they hear the good news and they're like, I'm in. Let me tell you my great, greatest news I ever got. I'm in my early 20s. Julie and I had gotten married, and um, it had been about five, six, we're going on seven years. My wife uh, was planning on having a, a large family. She's very uh, maternal and hospitable, and she's just a great mom. She's just built for, for babies and motherhood and making a home. And so we as a couple were really excited about raising a family together. Well, it soon became apparent that we weren't getting pregnant. And now we're pushing on seven years. And we had begged God over and over and over. You know, the pillow talk that, that husbands and wives have at night, going, what's going on? Like, maybe God hates us. Maybe we did something that God is punishing us for. And all those things go through your mind. And especially her, because it was very difficult on my wife. You know, other, other women just look around the parking lot and get pregnant. <laughs> and we were practicing, but it wasn't working out. Like, God has to build people. You can't build people. God has to build people. So you're at the mercy of God to have a child. And so we, it's, it's years, six, seven years. We're begging God, nothing. And you know what? It came to a point where we had to realize God has shut this door. And there was a moment in our marriage where we just were like, that's it. We have to be okay with God not giving us the desire of our heart. God shutting that door and going, I'm not gonna do, it. I'm not gonna do this for you. And we had to come to peace with the fact that God was not gonna do that. And I remember that moment. I'm working at Kinko's. And you guys remember Kinko's when we used to <laughs> copying place, whatever. We're going to Kinko's in Santa Clarita, and I'm just grinding it out, you know, just doing my regular old job like a shepherd, just doing my copies, making the copies. <laughs> my wife calls me, and I think it was actually on a landline, because it was before we had our electronic leash called your cell phone, and I remember talking to her, and she goes, you got to come home, and so I came home to our apartment, and um, we were just like dirt poor just begging God for just to help us out. The, the excitement we had in life was changing the flavor of the top ramen from beef to chicken. <laughs> and so she told me, hey, I'm pregnant. And we couldn't believe it. Like God had pulled off a miracle for us. And Here's the thing is that we didn't want to tell anybody. I don't want to tell my parents because we didn't know if her body, you know, if it was going to be a miscarriage or if her body would be able to go to. So the thing was that I had the greatest news. I had the greatest news. We had begged God and God maybe did a miracle for us. I had the greatest news ever. And I couldn't say anything. 
and it, it was weeks. We, I think we waited like six, seven weeks to make sure that this pregnancy would stay. And the, the good news just burned inside of me. I was like, I gotta tell somebody. It's like God answered our prayer. Nope. And here's the thing. When you got good news, the greater the good news, the more you wanna tell it. The more it should burn inside of you because you're built to tell people the great things that are going on in your life. So now let me extrapolate that into your walk with God. When is the last time you got excited about the gospel? When is the last time the greatness of Jesus burned inside of you? Listen, I know you probably don't like your job, but when you go to your job, the reason you have a job isn't to just make money to to feed your face. The reason you have a job is the people you interact with need need Jesus. They need the gospel. You don't have a job just to have a job. You have a job to share the gospel with people that are in your life. God put people in your life so that you could share with them. Look at this. After searching, they found the home of Joseph's relatives. Upon entering, they discovered Jesus in an animal trough, or also known as a manger, in the lower part of the house, as there was no space for them in the upper room. So I'm going to wreck your Christmas. Everybody ready? I specialize in wrecking Christmases. So you've probably heard this your whole life and you think it's from the Bible and it's actually not. That Joseph and Mary showed up to Bethlehem and the the, uh, innkeeper wouldn't let them in or they they were full or whatever. And so they're like, oh, where are we gonna stay? That isn't in the Bible, that's all made up. What is in the Bible is this. When Joseph and Mary showed up to Bethlehem, listen to me, I'm gonna tell you the real Christmas story and you're gonna have to go home and rearrange your nativity scene. (laughs) Some of it you're just gonna have to straight throw in the trash, okay? When they showed up to Bethlehem, they didn't go to an inn in the way that we would think of it. Uh, Inns, public places of sleeping, were extremely dangerous and violent in the first century. It isn't like showing up to a holiday inn here and, and, oh, where can we sleep tonight and Googling it or whatever. When you show up, it's like staying at hostels in in Europe. It's just a free-for-all. People sleeping wherever. You could be sleeping with a mass murderer or a princess or whatever. You don't know who you're getting. So it's very rare that you would ever take a pregnant woman or your children to an inn in the first century. What would happen, though, is that you would go stay with relatives. This is Joseph's hometown where his relatives are, which is why he has to go back from the census. They're sending him back to his hometown. You know who he has in Bethlehem? He has relatives, which is who he's staying with. Here's the thing. The word for in is the Greek word kataluma, which is, should be translated upper room. There was no room for her to give birth in the upper room. So it's the same word that's used when Jesus is having um, his last supper with his disciples in the upper room, kataluma. That's the exact same word that's used here when there was no room for them in the upper room. So look at this. Here is a picture of a first century home, a cutaway of a first century home. The upper part is the upper room where you would eat. This is the living room of the first century. So you have a living room in your home probably. Uh, This is where you would eat. The lower part, the the not part of the uh, upper room, is where the food storage is. That's where you make your food down below. And that's where the animals are kept at night. You wouldn't keep your animals outside at night in case they got jacked because you wouldn't want your donkey. They didn't have low jack in the first century. And so you wouldn't want somebody stealing your horse or your donkey at night because they're super valuable. So you bring them inside at night. Well, they need a place to stay. So they would stay in your home and they, you would have a feeding trough for them. A feeding trough was not, it's called a manger. The feeding trough was not wood. It wasn't made out of wood like most of our nativity scenes. They're actually made out of stone. So it would survive, wouldn't get broken, wouldn't get eaten by insects. Here's what a first century, they actually found one. Uh, this is a picture I took in Israel at Mount Megiddo and uh, they found one from the first century. And so this is a manger. So when you think of a manger, it's a stone trough that animals eat out of inside a home. So when you brought your animals in at night, they would eat out of this stone trough. So here's the thing. When the angel tells the, the, the shepherds, hey, good news, go find this kid, go around to Bethlehem, tell the good news. Hey, a savior's been born, the euangelion. Here's the good news. You wanna know why they would know when they found the right baby? There's probably a lot of babies in Bethlehem. Hey, is, is, uh, is, is the Savior here? Well, I don't know. We got a bunch of babies in the home. And they're looking around. The only reason they knew it was Jesus is because no woman lays her baby in a trough that's meant for food for an animal. They go, he's lying in a manger, which young ladies don't put their babies in a food trough. So they open up a home and they go, hey, is the, is the Savior here? Well, I don't know. What's he supposed to look like? He's in, our baby's in a trough. 
done. We found the right home. Because no woman lays her, lays her baby in that trough. Imagine there's no room up top in the upper room, in the Cataluma, because they probably had other relatives there for the census. And a woman for modesty's sake isn't going to give birth and for cleanliness sake up where everybody eats. So there's no room for her to give birth up there because there's probably other relatives staying in the home. So she gives birth downstairs. Once she gives birth, there's no place to lay him. So imagine Joseph just cleaning out this hay and the bugs and saliva and whatever garbage is inside this thing. And you lay your firstborn son in this. Talk about the humility of God. He doesn't come to Jerusalem in a palace. He doesn't become a Caesar in Rome. His lower class parents are so dirt poor, they got to lay him in a food trough. And the only reason the shepherds know they're at the right house is because no woman lays her kid in a food trough. Behold, you'll, lie, you'll see him in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, lying in a food trough, and you're going to know you're at the right house. Look at this. Here's our principle. The greatest king came in the lowest way. I want you to understand something. Ready? Your job in life is not to live a life of ease and popularity. If that happens for you, great. I'm happy for you. Your job in life is to give the gospel to other people. Live with humility. Listen to me and I'm done. Live with humility. Here's what humility is. Humility isn't talking down about yourself. Humility is saying, I serve God. Wherever he takes me, I go. Humility is saying, whether I'm rich, I'm poor, I have cancer, I'm totally healthy, I die a young age, I die old age, it doesn't matter, my life belongs to God. God crushes the proud, and God raises up the humble. So live a life of humility. All humility is, is saying is just saying, I live for God. I want God's will in my life. No matter what that is, I humble myself before God. I don't make my own way. I lay my way out before God and let him guide my way. That's exactly what happened to the shepherds. Imagine them. They got stinky sheep. They're doing their everyday job. But they hear the greatest news in history. They go into Bethlehem and they start opening doors and they find a baby, a young woman who laid her infant in a trough and they go, there's a savior of the world. And if God can come like that in a feeding trough, we as shepherds, as kings, as influencers, as people that don't have influence, wherever we're out on the social scale, we can be people of God that give the gospel to people who need to hear about Jesus. You got to change the way you view your life. Your life is God's. So live in humility. If God gives me a lot, great, manage it well. If God gives me a little, great, manage it well. But how, wherever you find yourself, give your life to God. Because your life belongs to him and will return to him. So while you have control of it, live for the glory of God. Live in humility. And God will use you for great things.